Did you ever sit back and wonder whether the different personality types affected ADHD in their own unique and different ways? Well, I'm here to tell you, absolutely so. Absolutely. 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 Yes. The different personality types and their characteristics and cognitive functions that come within personality types greatly affect the way people deal with issues that come with ADHD. On top of that, you have your nature nurture factors and the uniqueness that comes with a person's unique upbringing, the type of individuals involved in that person's upbringing, and the surrounding environment. And before we jump into this, I just want to state that there is much more variety than is thought when it comes to these cognitive functions of the different personality types. There are subsets upon subsets upon even more subsets. The letters vary greatly in ratio. And I just want to give a heads up that this video is particularly about ADHD and the personality types and how the individual can act when they're not feeling good and how to kind of spot it within yourself or how to spot it within a friend or family member so you can help them out and you can keep things uh, smooth if, if you catch the drift. So stuff doesn't go awry, doesn't go out of whack, and you know, people don't have a meltdown and life is good. Which can be a little tough when the ADHD comes a-knocking, especially when you're not having a good day. Whether it be because of not eating, not sleeping right, someone really upset you because of RSD. And speaking of RSD, yes, this will have a lot to do with this video as well. Rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. I have a whole long video on that. Link in the description below. So, yes, there are... Many variants and personality types are much more common here in the U.S. Some types are much more common in different parts of the world. And some types are really rare in some places and not so rare in others. Isn't the beauty of variety beautiful? Yes. So, let's go over a couple letters before we jump into the fun and the hootenanny. We have the different letters. We have the eight different letters out of the 16 personality types, which does not mean that there only exist 16 personality types. There are sub-variants among sub-variants ad nauseum. You can keep going. You have a certain personality type with these four letter combinations, and they meet somebody else of that same personality type. They can be completely different people. Why? Because ratios of the letters of how strong some of the letters are with the characteristics that they bring can be completely different than the other person. Why? Because our lives are lived uniquely. So, going first. In the first slot of the four letters here, when it comes to the personality types, we have the E's or the I's. Now, the E stands for extroverts. Extroverts are energized by people, enjoy a variety of tasks, a quick pace, and are good at multitasking. So, extroverts are lively people, like to be around other people, feel good, want to buy themselves, tendency to get bored a little bit perhaps, but don't get me wrong, some extroverts need their time alone. Some extroverts need quite a bit of time alone, but generally speaking, extroverts like to be around people like a quick pace, multitasking, being around other people, pumps you up, good time, do the do. Introverts, on the other hand, introverts often like working alone or in small groups, prefer a more deliberate pace, and like to focus on one task at a time. Introverts like being in their own world a lot of the time, doing stuff the way they like to internalize it. Sometimes working with too many people can be, uh, yeah, it can be a little stressful. We can get bored, we can get irritated, annoyed, saddened, fill in the blank. So we prefer to work by ourselves a good amount of time, which does not mean that introverts are all, I want to be alone at all the time. No, absolutely not. There are millions, tons, thousands, whatever number you want to say, many introverts who like to be around a lot of people, like to have a good time, and can actually be quite extroverted. It depends. It really depends on the person's upbringing and the details that entails. So that is for the first slot. You will either be an E for an extrovert or an I for an introvert. For the second letter, we have the sensing types and we have the intuitives. So that S stands for sensing, sensors. Sensors or sensing types, are realistic people who like to focus on the facts and details. They apply common sense and past experience to find practical solutions to problems. 
No. Sensing people are really in the outside world, meaning that facts and figures of what's been done and kind of how it's always been done is kind of their thing. Not the most abstract thinkers that are intuitive and think deep within, rationalize new ideas. You know, what if we did it like this? Not exactly censor territory. Sensing people are really good at knowing the outside world and what that entails. Not to say that a sensing type is not intuitive. Absolutely not. I have many friends who are sensing types who are quite intuitive and vary in their thoughts. But there's also quite a bit of people who are sensing types who are very much, it ain't Christmas if there ain't no snow and you cannot change their mind. Those are the people who need certain requirements for them to consider something, something. So... Then you have the intuitives, N in this case. Intuitives prefer to focus on possibilities and the big picture. Easily see patterns, value innovation, see creative solutions to problems. So here's where the differences between intuitives and sensors comes in. Listen, just the definition alone is very different. Intuitives prefer on focusing on the big possibilities and the big picture. Easily see patterns, value innovation. Value innovation. Here is where there's a contrast. Intuitives like working on ideas and things and doing it in ways that have not been done before necessarily. And that could be scary to a sensing type who's like, it's always been done like this, so why the hell would we do it any different? Because of progress. Because of wanting to innovate. So... Yes, that could be an issue, especially when an intuitive sees a different way of doing something and then they're not seen or taken seriously, especially if they're working in a sensing environment where a majority of people are sensing types or just like the other way around. When you have a sensing type who knows what's going to happen in a situation more concretely and you have intuitives who have never done it thinking that something's going to happen a certain way and the sensing type's like no no if we do that this is going to i don't know explode or something bad's going to happen so it really depends on the nature of it and i'm gonna get into it in more detail later on so and here's where we have a giant contrast (laughs) in this country we have the thinkers and then we have the feelers i.e we have the t's the logical types and f the feeling types So, this is for the third letter, and one of the biggest contrasts within the personality types. We have thinkers. Thinkers tend to make their decisions using logical analysis, objectively weigh pros and cons, and value honesty, consistency, and fairness. So, to a thinking type, logic seems to be the go-to when it comes to making decisions, and a value of fairness. If something occurs, you can usually logical types. If something happens, they cannot get angry with something or they don't get angry with something. If it's not realistic or logical, there's not much of a concern to logically concern yourself with something that is not logically realistic or possible to happen. A lot of logic in logical types. Which can also be difficult as well, because logic is not the only thing you have to use when making a decision. Sometimes we have to understand the emotions and the feelings behind some of the people that we're working with and why they do what they do. So a balance is definitely needed. We have now the feeling types, which would be the other letter in the scenario, which we would term these the feelers. Feelers tend to be sensitive and cooperative and decide based on their own personal values and how others will be affected by their actions. Notice how there's much more of a camaraderie vibe amongst amongst feelers. They tend to be sensitive and cooperative and decide based on their own personal values. Key, key phrases there, own personal values, and how others will be affected by their actions. Here's where a logical type is, okay, does that really matter? Do other... People's feelings in this scenario matter. And that could be a sense of a lot of conflict because sometimes a decision needs to be made where there's going to be a certain group of people, a certain person, a large group of people, whatever number it may be, that might not like what's going to happen. But for the better 
of the business, of the situation, of the overall circumstance, some things need to happen. And sometimes that disrupts the harmony of what's going on. So that's the means of how to approach that, how to find that balance. That's why in certain situations, there's always going to be a group of people or one person or a few people, however many, that is not going to like the outcome. And there's going to be the opposite group that's going to like the outcome. So we have that amongst the thinkers and the feelers. Then we have the judgers and then we have the perceivers. This last letter group, the J's or the P's, is essentially the motor of the personality types. This is what's the biggest driver in terms of how you're going to conduct yourself to an extent. And it it's really important. When you study cognitive functions, you're going to see what I mean. Let's start with the J's, the judges. Judges tend to be organized and prepared, like to make and stick to plans, and are comfortable following most rules. So J's, they're going to know what they're going to be doing, especially if they're pretty strict with themselves. They're going to know what they're going to be doing next week at 5 o'clock on Tuesday. They're going to exaggeratedly plan when they're going to use the restroom. And they like making schedules and like sticking to them. Not really good at improvising sometimes because of that. Not really good at improvising. Sometimes they don't like changing plans. They like making a plan. They have an idealization sometimes of the way stuff should be. And there's going to be a problem with that person either internally or outwardly, depending on the rest of the personality type characteristics. So overall... Judges like to plan, be organized, stick to plans, and have an idealization of how certain situations should be. Then we have the other letters. P, for our perceivers. Perceivers prefer to keep their options open. They like to be able to act spontaneously and like to be flexible for making plans. Usually people who are perceivers are quite good at improvising. They like doing something when the elements or the circumstance kind of feels best to do because you can you cannot plan sometimes you cannot plan to do something grand and grandiose sometimes the elements involved require you to wait so you can figure out more information so perceivers usually can be pretty quick on their feet they don't mind changing plans. They like being spontaneous with them. If the plans change, they can change with those plans within seconds, within minutes, however long and however disciplined they are. But they can improvise quite well. And if something needs to change, a game plan needs to change, a scenario needs to change, they'll figure out what they need to do pretty quick. That's a skill that they both have. They can figure stuff out pretty quick because of this, and it helps them improvise and do what they got to do. Just like the judges, the Jays, they're really good at creating their schedule and sticking to it, and they can be quite excellent in that sort of way. The key here is balance. Now, I've spoken about these letters in a very idealistic way. <laughs> Unfortunately... Our folks don't always bring us up in the most ideal way, and neither do instructors, and neither does life for that matter. So some of these letters and some individuals can be quite strong and can be a little overbearing. And sometimes some of these letters can be so weak and so untrained that there's going to be quite a bit of problems. You can have someone, for instance, who's such a critical unbalanced J that wants stuff done exactly how they planned it, that they're going to throw a fit unless something is done like that. Or you have a perceiver who has such a flexibility with schedules that they never stick to plans. They make plans with a family member or friend and they, they just keep flaking on them over and over again. That's just a good example of that. I can give you many, many examples for each of the letters. But I'm not, because we're going to jump into the different personality types now. Now that you got an idea of what the different letters represent. So if you want to take this test before we dive into the personality types to see what personality type you are as the listener, I left the link yet again down below. 
that you can see, okay? The Myers-Briggs exam. It's going to take you roughly, I don't know, I would say maybe 20 plus minutes. And if you take the test, I recommend you take it twice and you give answers that are honest, really honest, not your ideal version of yourself, but how you really are and how you really act and what you really believe with those questions. Don't try to sound amazing. Don't try to sound bad. Be as honest as you can and take the test twice so you can have a pretty concrete idea of what personality type you might be, okay? The more, more honest you are, the better the results, the more this video will help you out. So I'll be waiting right here until you get back. All right, now that you took your test and you came back and you know what personality type you are, and you've read a little bit about it maybe, let's dive into the nitty gritty. Going on to the next personality type, the INFP. So, in their healthiest state, INFPs are guided by their values and beliefs and have an inner integrity that shows in their actions. They want to contribute to their own personal growth as well as the growth and welfare of others, especially those who seem marginalized or neglected. They look for a life that has meaning beyond their paycheck. They often become involved in a charity work. They often become involved in charity work or artistic pursuits. They honor the emotional needs of others and are deeply empathetic. When it comes to their own endeavors, they are creative and big picture oriented. Now, we get to the INFP at their worst. So, in the unhealthy estate, INFPs become overly sensitive and self-aware. They tend to have difficulty expressing themselves and feel deeply misunderstood. As a result, they tend to isolate themselves from others and see themselves as either better or worse than most of society. Many INFPs in an unhealthy state decide to take up habitation in their imagination. Let me say that once again. Many INFPs in an unhealthy state decide to take up habitation in their own imagination. But instead of putting their ideas to use, they stay trapped in an idealistic daydream. One more time. But instead of putting their ideas to use, they stay trapped in an idealistic daydream. As they see the contrast between reality and their idealized future more clearly, they tend to become depressed. They may have difficulty taking care of their personal needs and seeing the practical realities that intrude on them. They may, they may forget to pay their bills, clean their house, or show up to work on time. They can also struggle with receiving constructive criticism, seeing all criticism as a personal attack. So, for those INFPs who have ADHD, these Scenarios might seem quite common. Wanting to be alone for the INFP. Wanting to be alone and be in that imagina imaginary world, the imagination where stuff is how they want it to be. So, if you're an INFP and you're seeing yourself go through these things, understand that you got responsibilities and things you got to do. We cannot sit around in that imaginary world. So if we're not taking care of ourselves and we're not taking care of the ADHD, we're going to stay in that imaginary world and we're not going to get much of anything done. So if you're an INFP who's not doing too good, it's probably not going to feel too good to hear that. But I'm sorry, it needs to be said. Take it for what it is. So if you're an INFP that isn't doing too good right now and want to get out of that state... Believe me, you can. You just need to show initiative. And if you need help with that motivation and can get it on your own, perhaps get a family member or friend to help you out with that. And if you can't do it, or meaning if you can't, if you can't contact or you kind of on your own and don't have contact with relatives or friends, or maybe they're too far off or whatever, then look for strategies online, whether it be a, some sort of YouTube video or something, Somebody you like or you admire that can be of help to you to kind of help you out in the areas that you need help in. I know it's hard to be motivated, especially if we're 
not feeling too good. And on top of that, we have ADHD on top of that. But believe me, there is a bigger, brighter outcome, bigger, brighter life once we take care of ourselves and our condition. So we have to be aware of these things, these things that we do, the self-isolation, the wanting to be alone excessively a lot. Sometimes we can neglect our loved ones or people, you know, that matter in our lives. So we can sometimes lose friendships and strain relationships because of not being around other people. So that's something if you're an INFP, you got to keep in mind. If you're an INFP or know someone who's an INFP, talk to them about this. This is something that if you're not aware of, you can't really take care. You can't really take care of these things. And I know some INFPs might be like, "This is too general. This is doesn't describe me," in in a big extent or to any extent really. Well, if it doesn't, then you know, so be it. Just move on. But I'm trying to speak to those INFPs who are listening to this, who this information pertains to. So, look at those characteristics that were discussed. And try to work on them. The bleak world view, the wanting to be in the imagination, the the negligence of the self-needs, hygiene, food, and stuff of that nature. You put that with ADHD, you don't eat good, you don't sleep as well with that. That's a terrible combination. It seems to be a terrible combination for the personality type altogether. You tie in the ADHD, it's just going to make stuff worse. So my hat goes off to INFPs who have to deal with ADHD as well. So take care of these issues. You don't have to tackle them all at once. Tackle them one by one. You know what the biggest issue you have in your life is. And if you don't know what what it is, reflect, be introspective, you're in your thoughts anyway, get out of the imaginary world and start working on or thinking about how am I going to fix this? What can I do to get myself out of this rut that I'm in? Pick yourself up. You can do it. So we encounter the INTP. INTPs at their best, INTPs are intellectual and independent. Solving complex problems is their strength. And instead of getting frustrated by novel dilemmas, they are stimulated and energized. They are generally reserved and contemplative, but also open-minded towards people, arguing only when it makes reasonable sense. They are often ingenious, insightful, and visionary, focusing on big picture outcomes and possibilities and finding ways to make them a reality. INTPs at their worst. INTPs who are in a destructive or unhealthy state tend to become very negative and critical. When dealing with other people, they are often sarcastic and condescending, pointing out flaws quickly without taking time to see the other person's perspective or hear the whole story. They tend to be isolative and argumentative and see people who want time with them as intrusive and meddling. In communication, they are insensitive and fail to consider the impacts their words and decisions will have on others. They may forget their tangible and physical needs and responsibilities. As a result, they may forget to eat, sleep enough, bathe, or pay the bills. Over time, they can become depressed and frustrated with their lack of connection with others or their inability to meet their practical needs. So, the INTP personality type is a very unique personality type. It's a personality type that's known as one of the most, if not the most, intellectual personality type in terms of logic. So, quite the responsibility. We have people like... Einstein, Socrates, yours truly, as INCPs. There's a lot going on upstairs in that noggin. And if you have inattentive ADHD, then there is an 
orchestra of an of ideas going on in in that head. So, if inattentive ADHD or just ADHD in general is present in this personality type, it can be very difficult. Why? Because INTPs growing up sometimes have trouble understanding social norms and can sometimes be accidentally rude. When you have a lot of knowledge and you understand how systems work, but you don't understand how people work, it can be very difficult. Now, splatter on some lovely ADHD on there, and that's going to make it even more difficult because then you're really not going to understand how certain people or how certain interests interests work especially if it's not stimulating enough you're not going to care enough to want to learn how to do that so as we get older though we see that the responsibilities grow and there's much more things that we have to learn that we perhaps don't want to learn so if you're an intp or not someone who is an intp work on these things if you are a jerk to people when you're not feeling good then work on strategies to help you not be like that to your family or friends or other people out there. Now, there's supplements that are very helpful in helping you out with the neurotransmitters that need to be boosted up, particularly the reward system, dopamine and serotonin in, in, in this instance. So take care of yourself. And if you're not sleeping all that good, which is quite common in the INCP ADHD world, Try to organize a sleep schedule and try to get consistent sleep. I know it's really difficult, especially at night when you want to look at a million different things and just dive into learning a system of something. But you got to be responsible for yourself. You got to take care of yourself so you can be a good person or at least a person that's not going to cause harm to other people when you're out and about. This can be family, this can be friends, this can be people, just your colleagues or anybody you work with in general. So it's important to take care of the self, to be mindful of your actions and be aware that your actions have consequences when you deal with people. People got emotions. Not everyone is a logical type. Some people, a lot of people, majority of people in this country are feeling types. And a lot of the time, they can't understand They can't understand stuff that digs deep or that needs a lot of logic sometimes. Not all of them, but we have to be mindful of that. Just how logical types can't always understand deep matters that deal with emotion. So we need to balance out the letters. That's the key that you should have or that one should have as a person is to balance out each of the the letters of cognitive functions. That way you'll be able to work and handle a big variety of stuff. They're not going to stay stuck and go through the negative motions when different scenarios come up. The more you balance yourself out, the easier your life becomes, the less of a jerk you sometimes have to be to people, the happier you're going to feel because at the end of the day, we want to feel a bit better. That's why, as INTPs, we watch the same show a million times that we've been watching for the last 20-something years. INTPs are really unique, special people. Extremely, extremely misunderstood. Really unique people. And if an INTP has has ADHD, it can be a really, really troubling life. It's a life, life of being misunderstood. You can't connect with a lot of people. No one understands you. Very few people. We're very few people. In the, span, in the lifespan of an INCP, depending on the INCP, we'll really connect with the INCP. A big reason why I wrote the book that I wrote was for that very reason. Because from the time I was a kid, through all the time I went through middle school and high school, I, I didn't connect with any anybody in that sort of way. There was no mentor. There was no person. There was no person that spoke at school. No one that I saw that, hey, that person reminds me of me and the struggles I go through. So, big reason why I wrote the book that I wrote was because of that. I wanted to share what it was like having an intensive ADHD with the personality type as well. Unique lens, so. 
INTPs are very, very special people that can also be extremely lazy. So if you're an INTP that is lazy as well and not doing much, get off your keister. Make something of yourself. Start working on some initiative to give to make something of yourself. Whether it be getting a career or inventing something great that's going to help change mankind. Yeah, or something less. Doesn't have to be that great, but aim to improve yourself. Aim to, aim to help your ADHD first and foremost, if anything. Help that. Take it step by step. It's not gonna have to be a whole thing at once, but it'll make a difference. You'll connect with more people, and it'll be a little rough, especially RSD. RSD for those of us who are inattentive types. While having ADHD is really rough, it's really rough for an INTP to go through some of the things that sometimes happen when you have ADHD. So that makes it double difficult because we really feel the rejection. The INTP feels the rejection. It can be very, very tough. And this can stop us from wanting to try and do many other things. And there can be quite an issue with anxiety sometimes as well. So... Yeah, there's definitely a lot of factors to, to work on and look, in, look into, but if one were to start on the ADHD tactics, it can make a big difference. It's a personality type. A lot of power comes great responsibility. But if you don't do jack, you ain't gonna go, you're not going to get anything done. But at the same time, if you don't do anything with that great power, anything of positive worth, then nothing much is going to happen. Go make something of yourself. Try to make a positive difference. Make yourself the goal to want to improve on yourself. So then, who knows? Who knows what lies ahead? From my perspective, if you're an INTP, you balance yourself out, you get your condition taken care of, I think, I think the possibilities are endless. And I'm hoping that they're positive ones too. So anyway... That's it for the INTP. The ENTJ. ENTJ is at their best <clears throat> in their healthiest states. ENTJs are intensely logical and organized. They make natural leaders because of their ability to envision a future and optimize a plan to make it a reality. They are quick to spot illogical procedures and are creative in their problem solving techniques. They are visionary, planful, and responsible. In decisions, healthy ENTJs try to be as objective, fair, and rational as possible. To others, they appear decisive and innovative. They aren't afraid to try new ideas, and they have an ability to see the big picture that guides them in every step of their lives. Confidence is a defining trait of the ENTJ. But the healthy ENTJ balances with an open-minded curiosity about new ideas and perspectives. Now we see the ENTJ at their worst. Unhealthy ENTJs appear aggressive and dominating, as if they don't care at all how their words and decisions impact people. Because of their strong ability to spot flaws, they appear highly critical and fail to balance criticism with praise for what is done right. In their relationships, they fail to provide the affirmation and connection that their partner or family needs. They tend to become very poor listeners when they are unhealthy and jump to conclusions and judgments without looking at all perspectives and details first. Under extreme stress, ENTJs can develop a martyr complex and believe that they are the only one 
dependable around. They may lash out at other people or feel sorry for themselves. So, if you're an ENTJ or know someone who's an ENTJ, and if somebody sounds familiar, when well, it's time to start working on them. I've worked with a few ENTJs who have ADHD, and a lot of these characteristics hit home. The being cutthroat, just brushing off anybody you kind of perceive as being incorrect, slow, or just not adequate, is very common amongst ENTJs when they're not feeling all that good. And then the sometimes ego that can sometimes develop or the martyr complex of I'm the only person that can do this thing right and I'm the only dependable person. If those sentiments sound like common cognitive domains that you enter, meaning that your mind goes into that frequently, then you're probably not doing all that well as an ENTJ. So sometimes this can mess things up in the relationship because there can be issues sometimes talking to your partner giving them the confirmation or affirmation they sometimes need or sometimes it's just not showing enough affection or love rather being really logical in the relationship and sometimes perhaps coming off as a little cold to close ones family friends and significant others so we got to look out for that stuff because that can drive people away which at the end of the day is going to mess things up for you in the long run so if you're someone that's in charge of a, group, of a group of people or a place, yeah, workers can get resentful and you can lose workers, you know. Over time, you can probably tell yourself, hey, I can get, I can get others, but when it comes to family, you can't. You got a family members or a, a family members in your family that walk out on you or don't want to be around you, that, that's going to be in their right. People can only take so much. People are not a punching bag. So other people got their limits. So if you know you got some of these problems that you're dealing with, work on them. Try not to jump to conclusions when you're when you're talking to somebody. And if it's a if what they're saying, you know, doesn't make much sense to you, or if you see some flaws in it, rather than you know going off on the individual, give it time. Give them a couple of ideas yourself. Be like, tell them, okay. That's fine and well, but, you know, what if you were to do fill in the blank? So the communication a lot of the times from logical types to feeling types can be what really upsets one personality type to the other. What logical types can do sometimes is that if we want to convey some pretty rough information or some pretty raw truth, if we do so with language that is not going to be as harsh Logical types, you'd be surprised how much information you can speak and share with people, particularly emotional type people, feeling people. If you were to alter some of the phrases, adjectives, or words that you use, sometimes for logical types, we just want to present the information. And since we're logical, we just want to do so sometimes in a very straightforward manner or sometimes we like to throw in a little humor sometimes a little dark humor sometimes so a feeling type especially when talking about certain subject matters that's really important to them or something they have a deeply held belief in or a moral standard with they're not going to be able to do that with certain things so that's where the issue comes so we gotta both learn how to be how to be understanding. At the same time, people in this day and age need to learn how to have a thicker skin. Being offended at a quite a variety of things is not gonna bring you any help in life. Being understanding of yourself and of other people and getting the help that you need and getting your ADHD under control, on the other hand, is going to bring you tremendous amounts of help in your life. Focus on the areas that need help on in here. Which is, as an ENTJ, your communication skills. How you communicate yourself and how often or not you're affectionate and emotional with, with certain people. Because if you, if you don't do that enough, people are going to perceive you as either a jerk, as a negative person. And I know you're probably telling yourself, well, I don't care if they perceive me like that. You're very well may not care, but it's affecting these other people. It's also affecting your family members or friends. You know, and those are your family members and friends. So you should really, 
aim to try to work things out if, if things aren't all that good. Believe me, words can be really hurtful. Logical types can't always see the the major impact that some of the things that we say that to us as logical types might seem so mi minimal and not really important, but that's not all the, all the personality types take. It's um, take that into consideration. And if you didn't know these were things to to work on, work on the ones that you need help with. And as always, if you're not taking care of your ADHD, start doing so. There's supplements and there's medication, and these supplements will help you out in the areas with the neurotransmitters that you have low levels of. And those things bring a ton of problems. A lot of people are probably wondering, well, I feel and act this sort of way because life is really difficult for me. Well, yeah, it is. Having ADHD makes life very difficult. This society is made more akin to neurotypicals. And even then, it's still difficult. Imagine how it is for people who have different cognitive conditions and whatnot. Or who have other other issues. Not to be biased. You gotta understand that everyone's got a different different thing they're dealing with. And some people struggle more, more than others. So, If we want to help people out sometimes, though, folks, we got to help ourselves out first. We got to be good. We got to be... Not 100%, but, you know, at least close to it. If we want to make some results. If we want to make some positive results and help other people out. So, as an ENTJ, help yourself out. So you can be more efficient. You can conquer more of those goals that you have. You can knock stuff out of the park. You can think quicker. You can organize yourself. And you can do it more so in a harmonious way, which in the long run will make you prosper. If you learn how to work with... A different variety of people. It's going to bring a lot of skill. And if we have ADHD and aren't taking care of it and lash out at people a lot, we're not going to learn very much from that. We're going to drive a lot of good people out that can otherwise be helping out the situation. And vice versa, us helping out them. So if you're not taking care of yourself or taking care of the condition, it's time to start. Going on now to ESFJs. ESFJs, at their best, are focused, empathetic, detail-oriented. They make excellent leaders. Because not only are they organized, they are also strong, compassionate communicators. They are not just focused on getting the job done, but meeting the needs, both emotional and practical, of the people around them. They are usually warm and kind-hearted. With an innate ability to sense what's appropriate and needed in any given situation. At their worst, though, ESFJs can be so focused on pleasing others and meeting their needs that they forget themselves and doubt their own self-worth. They tend to feel guilty and worrisome about any act of self-care, throwing themselves under the bus for anyone who needs anything. They can also be so focused on harmony that they become pushy or irritated with people who present uncomfortable truths or who have criticisms to make. Let me read that one more time. They can also be so focused on harmony that they become pushy or irritated with people who present uncomfortable truths or who have criticisms to make. They may rush people towards harmony instead of letting them sort out their differences in their own way. Seeing the big picture can be a struggle, as they get so caught up in current moment details. So the ESFJ is a very loving person, and can also be a person that can be hurt pretty easy, especially if they got RSD, rejection sensitivity dysphoria. So an ESFJ, when they're at, when they're at their worst, 
depending on the surroundings. So if it's a relationship-based thing, this is the, a common problem I see with a lot of ESFJs is they get themselves into a relationship with an individual who is really manipulative, really selfish, and takes advantage of them. So since the ESFJ has such a kind of heart and wants to make stuff work, you know, and wants the harmony there, and most importantly, if they have ADHD, they want their they want their reward system boost that their significant other is going to give them. So they remain in an abusive relationship, and this can be guy or girl. I've actually dealt with more ESFJ guys being abused by their female significant others, just because the guy is willing to do almost anything for the female, and the female just kind of toys with them. So. The ESFJ, if they are traumatized or they go through a lot of RSD when they're younger, they will put up their guard. They will put up their ego and they will try to walk all over people and control other people to make other people live in that harmonious world that they want them to. And unfortunately, they will try to make themselves leader over these people. So anybody who comes into that scenario and who is sometimes a logical type who is pointing out the inaccuracies and uh, basically what's wrong with what the ESFJ is doing sometimes, that really upsets the, upsets the ESFJ. So if you are an ESFJ or know somebody who is an ESFJ, understand that that is really manipulative. You cannot force or coerce people to follow along to an idea of something and force harmony upon them if they haven't finished resolving what they're doing. Just because you want to make yourself feel good. Also understand that staying in a relationship and thinking that I'm going to change this person. It's going to work. They're going to become this. And if you've been in that relationship for years with the person and you're seeing that they're not changing and that any opportunity to, for them to grow and mature and get the help that they need. And if they don't take that, then you're dating the wrong person or you're not with the right person. Because some people are very stubborn. And they're never going to want to change. So the biggest issue I've had dealing with ESFJs is helping them realize that they are being controlled by their own emotions in different situations and in different things. You got to look at it realistically. If no one's looking out for you, then no one's going to look out for you. At that point, because you're not even looking out for yourself. So if you aren't looking out for yourself, then who's going to look out for you in, in that instance? So if you got trauma and if you had a lot of RSD, it's something you have to work through. You have to find out what triggers that RSD. You got to find out what triggers the trauma and you got to work on that trauma. Look for resources online. So if, you got, if you're an ego-bound ESFJ, put your ego down. You're just a human being. You don't have to rub stuff in people's faces and make them feel bad just so they don't make you feel bad. It's really irresponsible. You have to work on yourself. And if you're a type of pushover ESFJ where people just walk all over you and you want to please everybody, you need to work on yourself. You need to not, not let people walk all over you. You're a person of worth. Just like every other human being. You got to aim for something and you got to also work on yourself don't be somebody's throw pillow don't be somebody to walk all over you help out people when you need to help them out you help out your loved ones your friends whoever it may be when you need to help them out but I understand that when you need the help you got to ask for it too it's okay it's okay to need help and to ask for help and for those of us who are esfjs who've been through a lot and I've had our RSD triggered a lot. It can be super hard to ask for help. Because what happens is we're gonna, we think that whoever we go to ask for help is going to make us feel bad. No, they're going to hurt us just like everybody else did. That's not always the case. Don't believe that lie if you believe that. Seek help. S speak to the right people. If you're surrounding yourself by negative people who are making your ego worse or making you keep your guard up. That's that's not the right thing. A lot of ESFJs sometimes hang around other ESFJs who are very just S people who think that, no, nah, somebody does that to you, you got to go do this to them. The tough guy, the macho mentality. Or for some females, it's just that's sort of tough. Like, she did that to me. How dare she do that? I'm going to go do that to her. That sort of S mentality-like stuff, you got to keep that under control. 
Because when somebody triggers that RSD, you're going to be thinking about hurting that person or causing some sort of harm to whomever in your head. And you're going to go through that circle of rage. So how do you work with that? Is you got to get your neurochemistry on check. And there's supplements for that. I have a whole video on supplements. You want to check out the link down below. You can see a video on how your neurochemistry affects your ADHD. First and, first and foremost, get your condition under control and then start working on a trauma or RSD or both that you've gone through. So you can really become the best ESFJ you can be.